Good evening and welcome to Office Hours presented by School Rubric. I am so excited to be here tonight. And please do not adjust your screens. Don't jump anywhere else. This is Office Hours. I know I look crazy, but we'll get to that in a little bit. I am so excited to be in this space once again with my good friend, Tracy. Tracy, I, I, I'm so happy to be in this space with you. Chris, super excited to finally connect with you after all of this time talking. And Allison, looking forward to connecting and working with you. So before I go any further, I know there are some amazing individuals in this space. So I want to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself. Tell us, uh, tell our audience a little bit about you. So Allison, we're going to start off with you. Awesome. Thanks so much. I'm so excited to be here. So I'm Allison Depew uh, from Missoula, Montana. I'm a longtime educator. I am also an entrepreneur, which is kind of crazy in the ed tech realm. Um, I own Inspired Classroom, which is an ed tech, ed tech company that builds scenario driven process based software, um, connecting mentors to learners. And so our whole goal is to elevate teaching and learning and create aha moments for students. Um, and I'm, I sometimes am a little bit of a magpie as well and get really excited about other projects. And I had one of those not too long ago and ended up publishing a book, Bear in the Bathtub. So there you go. It's so great to be here. Thank you. That is awesome, Allison. Uh, Chris, how about you share a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so I'm. Uh, it's good to be here. Great to be with all of you. Uh, I'm an assistant principal at Los Fresnos High School in deep South Texas. Uh, this is my 19th year in education. I'm just changing uh, students' lives one at a time as I as I as I I'm with them. So um, it's a lot of fun, a lot of a lot of behind the scenes work. I'm the behind the scenes guy, so that's my job. Thank you so much, Chris Allison. I, I so looking forward to learning more about you. And like I said, Chris, I am so happy that we get to share the same space. But our next guest is no stranger to this space. She has been on here all the time, a regular and a good friend of mine, Tracy. For those like two viewers watching who have no idea who you are, why don't you share a little bit about yourself? You're so funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm happy to be here. Always, always, always happy to be here. I am Tracy Browder. I am the host of Intelligogy, the podcast. I am co-founder of Grit Crew EDU, um, anti-racism, equity, diversity, inclusion. We partner with schools around the country, um, Don Harris and I. And I am also one of the newest team members of School Rubric, um, focusing on community engagement, diversity, equity, and inclusion as well. So really happy about that. But most importantly, I'm happy to be here with all of you. Well, congratulations. Tracy. Oh, wait, one more thing. Oh, one more ahead, thing. Go oh, ahead. my gosh, I'm sorry. And I just submitted my manuscript to DBC. So that book will be coming out sometime this year. Sorry, I just had to put that in there. <laughs> you, I was about to throw it out there for you. So don't worry about it. Congratulations <laughs> on all of the amazing work that you're doing. Um, and of course, you. My name is Charles Williams. I am serving as host tonight, which is super exciting. Uh, but I'm the host of the Counter Narrative podcast. Episodes drop every Friday um, and can be found on School Rubric, of course. Um, I am the principal of a small school on the far west side of Chicago called Plato Learning Academy. I am the founder of CW Consulting and, which we will talk about a little bit later, I am co-host of Inside the Principal's Office, one of School Rubric's newest ventures. So Tracy, they really have got us busy here, but- A little I'm bit. <laughs> not upset <laughs> at all, not at all. So today's special is a little bit, um, well, today's episode is special because it falls on Read Across America Day, which is exactly what we're gonna be talking about. But before we jump into our questions, before we do any of that, I just wanted to open it up and ask, what are some of your thoughts around today, Read Across America Day, when this day comes to you, what are some of the first things that pop to mind? So, you know what, Chris, I'm going to pop over to you first. I just think about all the students that we got together here and, and those Fresnos uh, getting together and reading, especially at our elementaries here in the district across across the district, reading um, different, different types of books, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, they're... they're upper grades reading the novels or the lower grades reading you know, the picture books. I just, it's a lot of fun to see the pictures that come out of that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Allison, what about yourself? You know, I love that reading builds relevance with students. And I think about that and, I, and in a lot of what I do is connecting experts with students and teachers. And so being able to connect and bring folks together, whether it's authors um, or illustrators, 
with the students and have them ask questions, talk and look at it and go, hey, I could do this or this is really cool. Anyone can do this. Absolutely. Absolutely. And of course, Tracy, I know you and I have spoken about this a little bit, but please, please share when reading across America, you know, comes to you. What does that mean? It's such a beautiful day because in this digital age, I feel like, you know, everything is technology and it's really up to us to continue to keep that love of literature in the forefront of kids' minds and hearts, because if we don't, it can be a lost art and we don't want that to happen. Absolutely, absolutely. And so, you know, we celebrate Read Across America Day as Character Day. So we encourage our students and our staff to dress up as a character from one of their favorite books. Hence the reason I am dressed this way. My grandson loves pirates. He has all his pirate books. There's the pirate alphabet and the pirate night before Christmas. So I had to walk around with those books because otherwise I'm just a weirdo dressed as a pirate right there. Uh, but it is a great opportunity to highlight the love of reading. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about tonight. So as we get ready to jump into these questions, first of all, I just want to once again say thank you to all of our viewers. I've been seeing names pop up. One of our good friends, Debbie, thank you so much for being in this space. Um, you know, and I love the fact that tonight we're going to have a conversation from people just really like all over the country, different backgrounds, different, uh, you know, ethnicities, it's everything. So I'm really, really looking forward to this conversation. To our viewers, before we jump in, don't forget that Office Hours is on weekly on Tuesdays. Um, make sure that you're subscribing and following so you can get all of the episodes, all of the great things that School Rubric is doing. So question one, I hope you guys are ready, comes from a good friend of mine, Hedrick Nichols. So whenever you guys are ready, let's see question one. Hello, I'm Hedrick Nichols, author, educator, and host of the YouTube series and podcast, Small Bites. It seems to me that students of all ages are quite distracted by all of the apps on televisions, telephones, and tablets. It's one thing to schedule and structure time for students to spend reading, but how can we move beyond that to get them interested and simply have them pick up a book and read for pleasure without being prompted? It's a great question. I think any of us dealing with education now definitely has experienced this. So Allison, I'm just curious, what are your thoughts about this question? Oh, I love this question and I have a lot of thoughts. Um, First off, I think making it a ritual and a routine wherever you are to put away technology and demonstrate that reading is important um, is key, whether you're an educator or a parent, um, having and finding that sacred space to say, this is my time to read. I'm going to put everything else away. Uh, I, it does so much for students to see that. That's my experience. Absolutely. Carving out that time is important. And I love the fact that you said we kind of model that, right? We have to set that tone for Got them. You. Uh, and, and Tracy, you know, Hedrick is a Texas native just like yourself. So let's bounce over to you. Absolutely. My girl and my neighbor. Um, first, I want to give a shout out to Samantha and Carly for being here. We are so glad you guys are hanging out with us tonight. Be sure and drop your thoughts in the chat and we'll be watching for that. Um, you know, it, it's really about that that personal connection. You know, I said a minute ago, it's up to us to kind of foster that love of literature. So we have to bring the passion. And in my classroom, I, I hope that I've revitalized that passion and I'm trying to get a firestorm behind it across the world. Um, hashtag lost in lit. So if we just get lost in lit, and, and so I looked at rein, reinventing dear time kind of in a connecting with the kids. So what if students knew that their favorite movie, they could find more details in a book, you know, and what if we brought those books to them, but that personal connection, we've got to find out what they like, you know, what if we are reading for pleasure and then we have this lost in lit day where we're not monitoring, we're actually modeling, enjoying, we're not micromanaging, we don't like to be micromanaged. Let's not micromanage the kids. Let's get down and dirty with them and just fall in love with those books. Chris, what do you think? I, know, I, I absolutely agree. We have focus on, on books of high interest, you know, that captured our students' imaginations. And I think movies is a great segue to, to bridge to, to unlocking that imagination of, of those of our students. I really think also, you know, thinking about fiction and nonfiction, you know, we got to advance those critical writing skills 
Um, and then even look into things like graphic novels. You know, that there there used to be a kind of a taboo about about graphic novels, but I can tell you that some of the best uh, textbooks that I've had out there, you know, as introductory texts, um, I think one that comes to mind is Larry Gonick's uh, Cartoon History of the Universe. So I don't know, that's just, I mean, I think that's a good, you know, kind of a good point, Tracy. Yeah, and, and real quick, you know, like when we bring books into our classroom, like we need to create the experience because I feel like so many kids are so far removed from literature. Like we've got to create the atmosphere, you know, be out on the beach, get a projector. Well, I say get a projector, but you know, you can do it. But I bought a projector and I had the beach on the screen, you know, up in the ceiling. I had a campfire in front of us. I just hit my mic. I'm sorry. I'm excited. Literature just, whoo. Um, I'm going to be quiet. Charles, go. What do you no, think? No, I, I was letting you create that scene. I was like, I was getting comfortable. Like I was about to well, open up my book, you know? You know, I had every class rotate through the room and we had laundry baskets. I use laundry baskets and pillows in my room, but but create this experience and bring in authors. And locally, we all have authors in our community who are willing to just come in and join us. I mean, we, we, we just have to be creative and get out of the box to foster that love and that reignite that passion. You know, I... I, I absolutely agree with everything you said. Um, you know, the, the idea that you said we, we got to model and not just monitor, right? And, and I think so often that's what kids are like, oh, it's a task. I got to do this. But that's one of the things that I talked about even today. Like, I want my teachers, I want my staff to, to, to really show that passion. So if I'm going to ask them to do it, then I have to do it as well, right? And so mm -hmm. we have to model everything it is that we do. It is not just about academic content and instruction. Right. So I love the fact that you mentioned that, you know, Allison, you talked about creating an opportunity, right? We have to carve out that time and not just say, okay, the first 30 minutes of the class, but Tracy, I want to connect it back to what you said is what if we created that as an experience, right? It's not just, I'm sitting at my desk and I have to open up my book, but I get to lay out under the star. Like, I'm sorry, but you said that. And I'm thinking like, we could have so much fun with it. I'll send you some pictures <laughs> and video, but you know, and tie that back to what Chris said too, Charles, like we added in the writing experience. So you, you see, that's an opportunity to just weave it all together. You know, like Ali said, that ritualistic routine. It's, 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 it's just in us. It's what we do. They're, like they're eager to come. What's the next book we're diving into? Well, Class you know, book study. Well, and I would agree, Chris, you brought up these graphic novels, right? I mean, who says that we have to read the boring old books, right? Our kids don't want to read them, but it's not about the text itself. It's about the skills and the knowledge that they're gaining from it. So if I am excited to sit down and read a graphic novel, then I don't care. Read that graphic novel because all I care is that you are igniting a passion for reading, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and to go one step further, you know, let's get them to create graphic novels. Let's get them to write what what go what the process of going into to writing and what the plot development and, and you know foreshadowing things like that. Those are all those parts. You know, that's a good way for them to connect. Oh man, we 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 are on to mm -hmm. something big. And so you know, I, before we jump into the next question, I just want to ask very quickly because we're talking about reigniting this passion. If you guys thought back to when you were younger and you had, you know, you loved to read, and that, what was that one book that you loved to read as as a child? So I, I'll start it off because I know I caught you guys off guard. So I'll give you some 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 thinking time here. I was in love with the Goosebump series. I would sit and I would read through them and read through them and read through them. And in fact, one of my teachers today said, "Mr. Williams, do you think we could get some Goosebump books for my kids?" And I was like, "Yes." They're on their way. Like right now I'm ordering them and I will sit in your class and read them with you guys. Cause that was one of my favorite series. So hopefully that gave you a little bit of time. Some jump in. What, what was your favorite book to read? I'm going to go for it. Absolutely. I read and reread the secret garden. I loved the idea that there could be secret passageways that would lead to other worlds. And I would like hunt through my house, like hoping to find like knocking on walls, hoping that I would find a mystery door that nobody knew was there. Absolutely awesome, awesome. Tracy, Chris? I'm, I'm gonna give a shout out to Debbie right quick. The back of a cereal box, right? Whatever you can get your hands on, because you know what, seriously? Like we sit at the table and my kids, they just get lost in the backs of those cereal boxes. So Debbie's on to something. Um, 
for me, do you guys remember the Judy Bloom series? Am I dating myself? <laughs> Love the Judy Bloom series. <laughs> nice, nice. Chris, was, what about you? I was big into uh, Encyclopedia Brown. You know, I just love yeah. those uh, books yeah. where he, you know, he would just use logic and, and power of observation to, to, you know, identify whatever he was trying to figure out. So I, I just absolutely love those. And uh, I mean, this is a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for sharing. And for all of our viewers, if you haven't read them, go check them out. I mean, not yet, like wait till this is over and then go check them out because we have question two coming to us from Pam Hubler. So let's check out her question. Yay, Pam. Hey everyone, this is Pam Hubler. I am an instructional coach in Charleston, South Carolina, and I am a believer that what we do as educators in school and classrooms is only half the battle, and that we need to have a strong partnership with parents in order to do to be effective with many of our educational goals for students. So I have a question. What are some strategies that we can employ as educators to engage parents in addition to students? instead of just simply telling them to read at home each night with their kids and hoping they do so. Can't wait to hear what you have to say. I love this question, practical ideas, making that home to school connection. So Chris, I'm going to come to you. What are some practical ways that you've encouraged reading uh, for your students while they're at home? You know, I think we picked up on a good point here. We wanna make sure we facilitate that love of learning. And so I'm, I'm big on like book talks, you know, student parent book clubs. Uh, I want to also throw kind of throw out there, you know, audio books. Went on a family vacation a couple of years ago and we listened to the Prince's Diaries, uh, Prince's Academy, Prince's Academy on audiobook. And that was just a lot of fun. We, we enjoyed that. So I think that was, you know, a, a good opportunity for us to just to sit down and enjoy and, and you know, not, not reading in a traditional sense, but it's still reading. Absolutely. I have an hour and a half commute on a good day. So audiobooks have become one of my best friends. So absolutely love that idea, Chris. Allison, what about you? You know, I think there's a lot of skills that we can give to parents to help um, instill that love of reading and literature and also just language in general. I think when we say read at home, it's a very broad, it's a very, very broad topic. And so um, we need to break it down. We need to be able to help scaffold for parents the way we scaffold for children as to why we're doing it and give them bite-sized chunks. So um, one thing that I have seen put in use has been really successful uh, would be like bus stop bites. So what's something that you can do with your child on the way to the bus stop that takes five minutes? And are there some word games that you can play just verbally passing them back and forth, um, some vocabulary? How can you bring some of those aspects of literature um, outside of the book and into just the everyday life when you're chopping vegetables, making dinner with your kids? So that would be something that I have put into practice, seen in practice and really appreciate. I love that small, right? Like we're not asking you to sit down and read a novel with your child. I mean, what you can, and that would be great. But hey, here's some small things that you could do throughout the day. I love those bus stop bites. It's that manageability. Like they don't have to like carve out this time, which is so precious and sacred now. Just do it while you're doing something else. That's really cool, Allie. I love that. Yay. <laughs> so, so Tracy, what about you? I'm sure that you have come up with some amazing things. So. What do you have for us? So a couple of thoughts on that. You know, it, we can bridge literary experiences. Like it doesn't have to be home and school. We can bring them together. So something I love to do in my classroom is... Um, take your parent to school. So it serves two purposes. We get to learn about parents' careers, even if they're stay-at-home moms or dads. We talk about that. They tell us how they keep the household running. And then the parent gets to read either their favorite book from, from when they were a kid, or they get to read their child's favorite book. But another cool opportunity we have, especially now in this hybrid slash virtual environment, when I do my parent workshops, I talk about, you know, teachers can host movie nights, like, but we can also host literary nights where we're 
all online together, like Team Zoom, whatever you, and we're all reading together. What if, what if a parent's reading or if we're at school during the day, what if we have a surprise visit from a parent or a cousin or just some relative, like they just drop in and read. I mean, just all those opportunities, such cool ways to connect where it's not just doing it at home and school, you know, it, it kind of becomes this bridging and partnership creation. Absolutely. You know, and, and I love the idea that you mentioned, you know, bridging that it doesn't have to be separate. Um, and, and I think this goes back to something that Allison had mentioned is that we want to make sure that our parents, right, we have to understand that some of our parents have gone through school systems that maybe didn't have amazing educators that mm -hmm. on this panel, right? And so maybe they didn't have a, a love for reading. And so how can I pass on a love to reading to my child if I don't love it? Right. So what we've tried to do is to create spaces to cultivate that love of reading with our parents. And so we, we love the literacy nights and bringing parents in and having opportunities to engage. But what about giving parents their own spaces to connect and to engage in texts and showing them real world examples uh, on how this is things that you could do with your child at home? You know, simple questions that you could ask. Um, so that has been an amazing way that we've connected. Um, I, I just love all of these ideas that you're sharing. And Carly, I just want to take a moment here. I mean, you have been like shouting out and comment. Thank you so much for your uh, support and, and all the work that you do in education. So I just wanted to take a moment there because I'm seeing you there. So um, as we get ready to wrap up here, I just want to ask any final thoughts when it comes to just encouraging a love for reading at home. And I, and I know I have one more thing I was going to talk about in a little bit here. But just any last thoughts or if you could give parents one tip, if you could say, hey, here's your one tidbit, your one takeaway. What would you give to parents maybe watching this or to educators that can share with their parents? Chris, what do you think? I, I, I'm really thinking about, you know, something that you said earlier, Charles, about how some some of our parents probably didn't have the best, you know, the, the best educators and probably didn't see themselves in the stories they were reading either, you know, so that's, I think that's key. You know, if we open up, open that up and so that the, the reader kind of is immersed in, in, in the experience, you know, they have a shared experience with the, with the characters in the, in the, in the story, I think that's huge. So, I mean, and choice, I mean, the choice is huge. Uh, we, I, I can tell you that I probably can count on one hand, the number of books that I'd read in, 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 in my years in, in public school, that I absolutely loved, you know, um, and the the two that I, I really, really keyed in on are, are actually two that I, I chose myself. So, you know, that's, I think that's huge. What about you, Allie? You know, Chris, something that I do at, at my house um, with my family is I will go out and I will either buy or check out books for every member in the family because I find that if we all have something that we really like to read and I, I will I'll do that based on I'll ask them what what, what book do you want to read or what are you interested in and I'll, I'll help facilitate and find that I find that if we're all making an effort and taking the time to read, then we're all doing it together. But if one person's off watching a movie or doing something else, it seems to draw everybody else in. And so when you can have a book and everybody's engaged in that book that they're, that they're reading, um, it's easier to carve out space and time and you want to do it and you start craving it at the end of the day or whenever it might be that you sit down to read. And so that's one of the things I've been doing recently at home to try to get the whole family involved. Absolutely, thank you. Tracy, what about you? I, I, I love that, Allie, that whole family engagement piece. You, you just spoke to my heart right there, sister. Um, you know, one thing, it kind of goes back to what Carly was saying and then what Chris was saying, because what, what was stirring in my head is, equitable access. Like right now in COVID-19 and a lot of families are at home, they might not have access to books. So, mm -hmm. you know, if schools can write grants right now, I, I know we're thinking about PPE and all those kinds of things, but 
there's still literary funding. So if we can find those grants to have books that we can literally give and not have this back and forth, like I, I, I wish we could put that at the forefront and not forget that. And then to Carly's point, we've got to say that out loud, like bring the parents in to speak in their own native language when they're reading books. Like I would just be sitting there in just just locked in awe listening to somebody just be immersed in their own culture what a great way to to just get immersed in each other's lives and culture and experiences you know absolutely absolutely and, and you know amanda just chimed in with one of the things that we talked about earlier right this idea of comparing the books to movies right and and i know that in my house we have books all over the place. My, my daughters have books in the rooms. We have books in the living room. You see, I have books behind me. They make me put my boring teacher books in, in my space here, right? But we have books all over. And so you try to expose them to that um, and, and just have a little bit of fun with it, right? Whether you're playing a game, uh, like, like Amanda said, comparing them to movies, like Allison said, let's just have conversations, right? I listen mm -hmm. to something crazy. My, so one of my daughters just graduated from her AP honors English class last year. And she would share with me some of the novels she's reading. I would sit there like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have no idea what you're talking about right now, but you got to show that interest. <laughs> Even if you don't know, just show that interest. Um, and, and so absolutely, I, I know that we are getting close to the end of our time here. Um, and, and so I want to ask each of you, um, would you mind sharing a book that you are currently reading? or that you may start to read soon and, and why you're excited about it. So Tracy, I'm gonna come over to you. Absolutely. Um, two books come to mind for me and I have, oh my gosh, if you could see my shelves downstairs, whoo. Um, Powerful book by Terry Savelle Foy, Five Things Successful People Should Do Before 8 a.m. And in this book, she talks about way before 8 a.m., like a full eight hours almost. Just kidding. Game changer book, must read. Um, the other book is by Susie Brooks and a dear friend, Matt Joseph, Modern Mentor. I am so ready to dive into this. I've been skimming and just pulling out bits and pieces. But talk about reimagining mentorship and education. We need that now more than ever. So I can't wait to read that book. Absolutely. Matt is an amazing individual. Um, so I can only imagine how great his book is. Um, Absolutely. Chris, what about you? What are your two picks? So actually, I just have one and it's A Friend Divided uh, by Ernesto Cisneros. I'm I, I just been very excited to, to pick this up. Uh, it was I got notif notified it was delivered earlier today. So I don't read a lot of fiction, but this will be my first one in about a year. Um, excited because it's a an author of latin descent um who's also a teacher so that should be a lot of a lot of fun reading absolutely um i am looking forward to hearing more about it i'm curious a little bit so please feel free to share as time goes on as you're diving into it uh allison what about you well i've got two books that i'm i've got on my bookshelf right now by my bedside table so one is Sprint, Solve the World's uh, Problems in Five Days. And I love this one from an entrepreneurial standpoint, but especially from an ed tech standpoint um, and an educator turned entrepreneur, I love the idea of bringing in concepts that are really important out there in the real world and bringing relevance and authenticity into the classroom and starting to mirror and teaching students how to engage in that process at a really early age. So I'm always looking for this type of book and these types of um, things so I can go, oh yeah, I see how that relates to the classroom. Totally, I get this, let's do it. Um, and then the other one is Concrete Rose, which is Angie Thomas's new book. And this is a book that my, let's see, my 14 year old is reading. And so I like to pick up books that they're reading as well um, and read with them so I can have a conversation and learn a little bit more. And Angie Thomas is a phenomenal writer and um, I, I can't wait to dig into it. Wonderful, yeah, it's always nice to be able to connect with your family, with your students, to know what it is they're reading. So, you know, teachers do not be afraid to pick up those YA books and, and really dive in. And some of them are really fun. 
I personally love the Percy Jackson series. I consumed all of them. So, yeah. You know, I... I got to piggyback on that, Allison. What you said is so important because I made a note not to forget to say it. Like my yeah. son and I, I read his books all the time and everybody in the house is like, you two nerds, what are y'all talking about? Like that, uh, oh, that just takes relationships to a whole new level. Yes, yes, yes. And, and Tracy, and, and I, I'll, I'll mention this as we get ready to close out, guys, viewers, I know there are so many things that like we touched on. And we would love to venture down all of those from the way that this could build relationships to Chris mentioned, you know, with diversity and equity. I mean, there are so many avenues that we need to go down, but we're only allowed about 30 minutes. That's our goal. And I know that we're already like getting close to that, if not over it. So we will continue this conversation later on. But before I do so, I'm going to share with you my two books. Um, so the first one is more for my teachers. It is called Read Aside. And so if you've never heard of it, never read it, I would encourage you to do so. It really talks about how we need to be careful that in, in trying to build a love for reading that we're not actually killing it, right? We have some practices in place that really destroy reading. I mean, think about it. If you connect reading with punishments, I don't really want to read. So please make sure that you check out this book. And the second one is one of my favorites. It is one that I taught years ago when I was in the English classroom. I was a huge fan of Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet, but my kids, not so much. So I found Julio and Romeo, exact same story, but a little bit different. You have a Hispanic guy, you have a, a African-American woman who fall in love, which is not allowed from their two sides. And so you got that classic story. This is a great example of how you could take a classic, turn it into modern day and allow students to see themselves in it. So I would encourage you, if you've never heard of it, check it out. So with that being said, for all of our viewers, I want to say thank you so much for tuning in. Like I said, there, there's so much that we still wanna talk about. So I would encourage you to join all the conversations that you can find on schoolrubric.com, on Twitter, all over the place. We're going to post some questions for some follow-up and some dialogue. I would encourage you to participate and join in. And of course, before we jump off, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about two amazing shows that are coming up this week. The first one is Global Take on March 4th. Now that's 6 a.m. Eastern Standard Time or 11 a.m for our friends across the ocean over there in England. So please make sure that you check out holistic education from an international school context. And of course, I have to talk about this Saturday at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. My friend Mac and I will be hosting um, inside the principal's office where we will talk about how we cultivate trust with our stakeholders. So I hope that you're going to be joining School Rubric and all of these great shows um, for these and everything coming up. So again, I want to say thank you for your time. Make sure that you like, subscribe, and follow, and I hope that you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you for joining us. Good night, everybody. <laughs> thank you for watching Office Hours presented by School Rubric. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we highlight voices and perspectives of educational leaders across the globe. To stay in the know with our latest upcoming panels, interviews, tutorials, and more, make sure that you follow us on social media or visit us at schoolrubric.com. Thank you.